Okay, very good morning. It's March 31st and we've just had Deliveroo debut on the London Stock Exchange and they're down as much as 30%, 3-0. So Eddie, what's going on with Deliveroo? Yeah, for, nice to be on with you again, Ant. Frequent occurrence nowadays. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, uh, I, funnily enough, I actually ordered something from Deliveroo last night. So very interesting <laughs> <laughs> to see them IPOing today uh, in London as well. So it's a big... Mm. Uh, coup for London, where usually you see these big tech IPOs in New York and Hong Kong, Shanghai. So it's a big testament to <coughs> Rishi trying to attract some UK and European based startups, really. Well, not delivery is not a startup, but tech companies to, to IPO here. But unfortunately, they, they were down as much as 30% uh, this morning uh, in opening trade. Uh, so not a great debut from them. Um, they do uh, face really stiff competition, really, uh, from Uber Eats, Just Eat, um, and then some niche grocery apps, Gorillas, Get Here, et cetera. Um, but yeah, they, they actually priced at the very lower end of their range, uh, and this was revised anyway. Um, so it's not looking good. Uh, basically shows that the bankers, and this is Goldman, JP, um, Bank of America, City, Jefferies, they were the, <coughs> excuse me, the joint book runners on this deal. Uh, they've priced it seemingly too aggressive, uh, mm. aggressively for, for investor appetite. Yeah, I think I was reading a stat. I was just trying to find it. I think of, I think there was, has there been five in London IPOs so far this year? And this is the first one that's really flopped like this. Yeah, I think some commentators this morning are talking about like this is you know not a good sign for london and this is why i you know, mm. company shouldn't uh ipo in london i don't really think that's the case i think i don't know if you remember i think it was uh you and i had the conversation about you know airbnb and then i can't remember the food delivery service that ipo'd just um in america but you know you, you were saying should you invest in either of those and i'm saying you know, I prefer an Airbnb to that uh, that delivery company just because look where we are, right? We're in a COVID pandemic or hopefully we're emerging out of it, but this is really the best they're going to get, right? You know, everyone's at home ordering food. You can't go to restaurants. Uh, and like we've talked about, you've got this wall of money, especially in the service sector. Uh, savings have been uh, increasing dramatically and we're ready to go. Right. We're ready to go to these restaurants. We're ready mm. to spend money. We're ready to go back to the office in some capacity and order, you know, from Tesco's or, you know, the, the little food deliveries will go and walk there right in the city of London. Whereas now, you know, you want dinner, you want lunch, you're going to just order it on your phone. Um, mm. So I don't well, think. Well, it's yeah. well, one, one thing that I just wonder, like longer term behaviorally, I mean, one thing the pandemic i think you're right i think there's definitely pent up savings is going to be spent and people are just eager to have that physical kind of environment again but one thing is that people have really consumed let's say that immediacy of what amazon prime gives you let's say and our consumers now are going because what i went to sainsbury's the other day this delivery big fat sticker on the front and it's like oh hang about so I don't even need to wait for a cardo or waitrose to whatever to Tesco to deliver over booking a slot. I just get my shopping Deliveroo can deliver it from a major supermarket. I mean, yeah. is that is that a longer term? Do you think there's any shift behaviorally in that way, given given people's appetite for like now kind of consumption? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's definitely. I think Amazon has ruined the whole world. Right, that everyone <laughs> expects you know minute by minute action yeah. basically. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is a good investment, right? This is that's a secular trend, and that will yeah. continue to be the case. But actually, in this industry, um, you know, they don't make a lot of money doing that, and the 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 margins are kind of razor thin uh, mm. from food delivery. So it's really where do I see this going in the future? And some big firms have made big acquisitions. Is kind of robotics automation in the sense of restaurants not having chefs. They have robots that then get picked up and then deliver. Cool, um, that's a big uh, that's a big one for the food industry. It's, it's for the food reality. Lover. Yeah, well, it's the reality. <laughs> uh, you know, if a robot can do it uh, and uh, do it quickly, with that's like saying, can a robot make classical music or paint fine art? Oh, it can, well, it but can. is it the same? <laughs> yeah, well, there's always going to be that um, fragmentation, yeah. right? There's going to be Michelin star where you're going to want the chefs, but mm. everything else, do you really want it? Um, but Okay, so back to the kind of IPO in terms of yeah. why is this flopping yeah, uh, why? 30%. Uh, 
um, basically priced it very aggressively. Tech company is, is, is uh, common. Um, the comps, you know, they were, I think they were trading at five to six times revenue. Again, another company that doesn't make any uh, profits. So they have to be valued on, on revenue. Uh, and this was actually greater than peers. So just eat and things like that. So again, it was richly priced from a, a revenue times basis. Their loss making, so they reported a 225 million pre-tax loss for 2020. So put that in context, that's a worldwide pandemic, the best conditions you're ever going to get. With that being said, they've got a, a lot of fixed costs going on. Uh, and that is, you know, that is the fixed cost growth is uh, forecasted to slow. So that, is, you know, they need, to, like with any company, you need to set up, obviously, and the fixed costs there uh, are eroding the, the, the revenues to, to a negative profit. Um, but again, this comes, at, um, you know, uh, a gig worker economy type basis. So we saw, saw Uber as well kind of uh, enrolled in this. So at the moment, they don't classify their riders, their drivers as employees, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the IWGB, British Union, representing gig economy workers, said there's going to be a strike on April 7th. Uh, and I know Aviva, Rathbones, Legal in General, they were citing deliveries, lack of profitability, uh, mm -hmm reputation, financial risk, uh, but it's all, it all really comes down to the fact that if these contractors are workers rather than kind of uh, well, contractors, mm. then there's going to be, have to be a minimum wage, employee protection. And so is there, is there any parallel here with Uber in the way that they had their worker right issues? I remember when they, Uber debuted, they, they dumped at the open at the time. I mean, is there any, any comparisons there for workers' rights yeah, definitely. I think, look, we've moved to this gig economy where everyone's kind of a contractor, right? A freelancer mm -hmm. and they work and um, for these various big tech companies uh, where they're kind of predominantly it's a technology company and then there's kind of little people running around <laughs> doing the, the day to day. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is going to be common for every kind of gig economy and there's going to be increasing political scrutiny on this kind of, say, uh, on this kind of uh, issue. Um, so this is probably why investors uh, have been a bit, little bit nervous uh, in terms of they priced at the low end uh, of their IPO range, uh, range. So this means that the investor demand running up in the actual mm. roadshow and the book building process wasn't quite there. Uh, funnily enough, I've actually got uh, my day job. <laughs> I'm running a, a big uh, IPO session with a very uh, solid business school ESCP today uh, and we're going to be discussing uh, the management roadshow the book building process um, so really looking forward to that and obviously this delivery IPO comes at a great time yeah uh, I mean what we'll, we'll finally to wrap this up then what is yeah. the consequence for these guys who ran the book I mean is it is it I mean how does it work because I don't know this is not the area that I I work in and my career has been in so they have one very missed let's call it managed or mispriced valuation. Does that then mean that that's a no-go then for future, for future like other companies coming to IPO process? Or is it just written off as some reason that they can explain away? Or how is that managed on the, the firm side? Yeah, look, we're, we're still, um, although it dumped 30%, you know, that's a lot of price discovery. That's the macro context, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the market sentiment, short and weak, all those different types of things. Uh, likely, there's going to be <laughs> no consequences for, for the bankers involved in this. It doesn't, uh, you know, similar to past IPOs, you really need to see the kind of price discovery over the three months, six months, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, but again, you know, should, this may actually now, in my opinion, look again aggressively priced. If we all go back to restaurants, they get hit on demand. So, in terms of them pricing it too aggressively, nothing's going to be. Uh, they're not going to be challenged on this too much, and that's really the case. And this is why uh, a lot of uh, technology companies and real just target companies have been going public via SPACs, right, to avoid this whole right. uh, process. And you know, who knows if um, they went public via a SPAC it, quickly, and because that was a, that's an advantage of a SPAC that mm. uh, kind of the reverse merger process happens very rapidly. Whereas mm. you know the old-fashioned IPO where investors actually care about financials and there's a lot of due diligence, kind of boring now. Uh, that takes a long time. 
So mm. if they kind of went public via SPAC last year in the COVID pandemic, obviously investors uh, and retail, you know, et cetera, would be like, wow, this is a great company. You know, this is yeah, yeah. like the, the, the pandemic. Yeah, six it's, months too late or 12 yeah, months too late. <laughs> potentially. So uh, nothing will happen for the bankers and, you know, that relationship there. Mm. Let's just get this straight. The CEO uh, is going to be a very rich man regardless. <laughs> um, but you actually, you know, it dumped on the first day of trading, but this may be, you know, the macro environment and actually the, the trading uh, conditions today, this week, this month. But mm. really, you can't determine until maybe three months, six months. You do need to give the mm. price discovery process, you know, some time to breathe, really. Okay. Well, great. Look, I know you're busy. I know you're yeah. running that IPO sim um, later. So, Good update, and uh, yeah, look, it, it seems like we're doing this on a daily basis from now yeah. from now on. Great, yeah, sounds good. Cheers, Eddie. Perfect. Thanks. Take care.